welcome to this session on oil commodity uh, prices. Uh, so, which the, those three papers are going to explain how, from the oil market, there is a spread off on so on the uh, commodity side. Um, so, our first speaker is Ron Alquist um, from the. So, first of all, let me thank the organizer of the conference for inviting me uh, and asking me to present my paper. Uh, the title of my paper is Commodity Price Code Movement and Global Economic Activity, and it's joint work with Ali Kordian, who's at uh, UT Austin. So, what's the purpose of our paper? Well, what we wanted to do is we wanted to use a simple general equilibrium model to provide a statistical interpretation of the, un of the statistical factors, excuse me, economic interpretation of the statistical factors that drive the common variation in non-energy commodity prices. Everybody in this room can think of a variety of market-specific developments that would affect the price of individual commodities. So you can think of a, a drought in the, mid in the American Midwest affecting wheat prices. You can think of a strike in uh, Chilean copper mine affecting copper prices. But we're not, we're not interested in those uh, commodity-specific uh, shocks. What we care about are what the fundamental macroeconomic drivers are of the common variation in a set of commodities. And so what we do is, is we collect this data set of 40 non-energy commodities, and we apply a method for testing the restrictions on a factor model. So this is just a statistical factor model to this new data set. And what we find is that the common movement, so the first principal component, uh, is primarily related to global economic activity. And then, in the, sort of in the, in the next step of the exercise, we uh, look at the ability of this first principal component to forecast the prices of individual commodity prices, as well as the prices of several widely used indices in an out-of-sample forecasting exercise. And we find that we obtain meaningful improvements in uh, the forecast accuracy using this simple factor augmented VAR relative to a no change forecast. So here's the outline of my talk. And just to make sure I have 25 minutes. Yes. Yeah, okay. So first I'll talk about the model. I'll just give you a schematic representation of the model, of the details are in the paper. Uh, I'll talk about how we use the model to achieve identification of the factor, so uh, uh, how we associate an economic interpretation with each of the factors. Then I'll turn to uh, how we implement the model. Um, I'll do a historical decomposition of fluctuations in commodity prices, as well as an independently uh, derived measure of global real activity. And then I'll talk about the forecasting exercise. So the model is actually the model's quite simple. Um, and what, it, what we have is we, we start with a household. Uh, that supplies two uh, inputs. One, labor to the final goods sector, um, and another uh, uh, input that we, lay, that we call land, for want of a better word, to the commodity producing sector. In the commodity producing sector, there's a continuum of commodities that are, that are produced. These are bundled <laughs> together into an intermediate commodity good, and then sold to the final goods sector. The final good producer then uses labor from the household, plus the intermediate commodity good to produce the final consumption good. In the, in, in the model itself, there are six shocks. There's a shock to labor supply, there's a shock to, to the supply of land, um, and there are productivity shocks to the, to individual, uh, the production of individual commodities, one of which is common, the other which is specific to each commodity. But I'm, for, to illustrate the identification and how we get identification using the model, I'm going to focus on the productivity shock, so this is a standard uh, TFP shock, and also the relative input demand shock. So this is a shock to the relative demand of commodities in the production of the final good. So let's start with the productivity shock. What we have here is a supply, supply and demand curves for an individual uh, uh, commodity. And let's study what happens using this simple uh, model when there's an aggregate productivity shock. I have two supply curves here, one for a relatively elastically supplied commodity and one for an inelastically supplied commodity. 
So if we think that there's a, a positive productivity shock, that's going to increase the demand for each individual commodity. Uh, and at the same time, for technical reasons, the way we set up the model, there are going to be income effects related to the supply of land. That's not uh, important for the main results of the paper. But what happens, given in this setup, is that there's a the household restricts the supply of land uh, to the commodity producing sector, so we also have a supply effect. So both supply curves shift in. The demand curve shifts out, and both supply and the supply curve uh, generally shift in. And what happens is, in this particular example, is the price of the inelastically supplied commodity goes up by more than that of the elastically supplied commodity. But the main point here is that the prices of both commodities go up. And that's through the indirect effect, and that word's going to be important for reasons you'll see in a, in a, in a moment, the indirect effect of uh, the shock on commodity prices. And it's indirect because it's operating through the effect on aggregate output. And so what we can do is we can say that these types of shocks are generally going to induce positive co-movement among all commodity prices. So all commodity prices in response to this type of shock are all going to go up or all, they're all going to go down. Okay? You can think of it uh, as a demand shock. That's, one, that's, one, that's another way to think of it. Um, the point here is that, this can, is that this is going to impose restrictions on this, the factor loadings when we write down the factor model. And it's going to help us to associate um, an economic interpretation with one of the factors. Now let's contrast that with the effect of a relative commodity demand shock. So again, <coughs> we're, going, well, we're going to have a decrease in relative demand for commodities and the production of the final good in such a way that it increases aggregate output. So what happens in, in, in the first round is there's an increase in aggregate output, which has the same uh, uh, increase in, in demand that we saw in the last example, and then there are going to be the same supply effects. But what happens in general equilibrium in this particular example is that because there's been a decrease in relative commodity demand uh, in the production of the final good, demand for in individual commodities also goes down. And it goes down in this particular example in such a way that the price of the elastically supplied commodity goes up. Right there. And the price of the inelastically supplied commodity actually goes down. Now, that just happens because of the way I drew these particular curves. The point here is that it's going to depend on the underlying demand and supply elasticities. Okay? So in contrast to uh, the other types of shocks that we're going to classify, which have an un unambiguous uh, uh, effect on the signs of all, on the prices of each individual commodity, here it depends on the elasticities. And, and that's important because the signs on, on factors that have this type of effect are generally not going to be determined. They'll be commodity market specific. Um, and so you could have some shocks where that would, uh, that would have a positive effect on, on certain commodity prices and some that have a negative effect on certain commodity prices. And that's going to allow us to distinguish between the different types of, of, of commodity shocks and relate them to the factors. So if you go through uh, the math, and this, the, the, proof, the proofs are in the paper, uh, you get the equilibrium price of an individual commodity, J, and the factor structure comes out of it quite naturally as a function of the underlying structural sh shocks. So first we have an idiosyncratic component, that's in red here, uh, and that's, that's basically the, um, uh, the productivity shock uh, for the in the production of, e of the individual commodity. We also have the indirect commodity factor, so that's in red here. Uh, and this summarizes the effect of the shock, so it's the composition of all these structural shocks that only have indirect effects. And the way you can interpret it economically is that it's the log deviation of aggregate output arising from the shocks that only have these indirect effects. Indirect, again, because they're, they're, they're coming from uh, the, the effect through aggregate output. And the restriction placed by the theory um, that we can take to the data is that the lambda jy right there, so that's the factor loading, that uh, for each individual commodity J, they should be positive. <clears throat> that's not true for the uh, additional factors. So these are what we label the, the direct commodity factors. Um, in principle, there should be one direct commodity factor for each commodity <coughs> shock, 
in the data, we don't find that that's necessary. We find two factors, one the indirect commodity factor, one the direct commodity factor. Um, the, the point here is that the coefficients on the direct commodity factors don't have to have the same sign. Some could be positive, some could be negative. It'll depend on the commodity. And so this is a way that the theory is, is, is going to help us disentangle the endogeneity of real commodity prices from aggregate activity using standard factor methods. So the problem with, with factor models is the rotational indeterminacy problem. Um, you can estimate uh, the factors using principal components, but for any orthogonal matrix T, you can, rot you can simply rotate the factors, and it's going to summarize the same statistical information, but the behavior of the rotated factor is going to be very different from that of the original factor. And so this is why people say that factors aren't identified. Uh, what we're arguing in this paper is that you can use this theory to assign an economic interpretation to the factors and actually get some economic interpretation. So uh, what are the three ways that, that, that we can solve this problem? So the first one is that, or the first two is, is that the indirect commodity factor uh, should be orthogonal to commodity related shocks. The second one is that the direct commodity factor should be orthogonal to non-commodity related shocks. And the third one is the loadings on the indirect commodity factor should all have the same sign. So these are ways that we can, we can uh, that are going to help us get some uh, leverage on how to interpret the uh, uh, economic factors, uh, excuse me, the statistical factors. Uh, so I recognize there's a sort of, there's a lot of math here. The, 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 the point of this slide is to give you an idea of, of what we're going to do. Um, Basically, uh, we're going to take this rotation matrix T, okay, which is a function of, it's a matrix of sines and cosines, uh, and the estimated factors, and we're going to see the extent to which we need to rotate the estimated factors to make sure, to, to ensure that they're consistent with this orthogonality condition. So if we interpret the first factor as being uh, the indirect commodity factor, uh, what this tells us is, is that if we have a vector of commodity-related shocks, that this orthogonality condition should be satisfied. Um, and in other words, that the, that, the, uh, that the rotation matrix should look like the, the identity matrix. Um, and we can estimate this using GMF. And you can do the same thing for uh, the direct commodity factor. <clears throat> the other thing we're going to do is we're going to look uh, at sign restrictions um, to see how much we would have to rotate, say, the first common factor to ensure that all, uh, excuse me, the factor loadings, to ensure that all the loadings were positive. So remember, one of the implications is that, um, uh, that commodity prices uh, should all load positively uh, with respect to the factor related to global uh, economic activity. And so we can test this uh, and get a set of models, a set of admissible rotations that satisfy that condition. Let me turn now to how we, uh, how I empirically implement the model. <clears throat> One contribution of the paper is the data set, which in some cases goes back to the late 1950s, although we start uh, the analysis in 1968. These are all spot prices. Um, we selected the commodities subject to some criteria. We didn't want vertical integration, so there's no fertilizers or energy in the data set. Um, we avoided precious metals because those uh, markets function very differently than other industrial and agricultural commodity markets. Um, we were careful to avoid uh, the prices of commodities that were derivative products of other commodities uh, and also uh, commodities that were subject, where prices were subject to regulation or even a cartel, so there are no sticky prices. And in the end, we came up with a data set of 22 agricultural and food commodities five oils, which means food oils, so like palm oil or peanut oil, and then 13 industrial commodities. <clears throat> the point of this table is to show you that we really only need a two-factor representation uh, to summarize the common variation in, in, in this cross-section of commodities. Um, so if we look in the top panel here, um, this is the variation uh, explained by the first principal component. You can see it's between 60 and 70 percent. Uh, when you add the second principal component, that, put, that uh, adds another 10 percent. Uh, and if you do formal statistical tests of the number of factors needed to explain the variation in the data, you come up with about two, usually. 
Okay? Um, so we're going to go with a two-factor representation. To test the uh, moment condition, we need a plausible set of commodity-related shocks. And so here we use, we rely on some of Lutz's work um, of uh, oil supply shocks, which is a, it's a measure of the uh, uh, OPEC production shocks. Um, and what we do is we uh, estimate, we test this moment condition um, using 36 lags of the OPEC production shocks uh, uh, plus a, the kind of temporaneous shock and a constant. Uh, and we estimate the theta using iterative GMM. And so remember, the test is uh, how much we need to rotate uh, the factors to make them consistent with an implication of the theory. And what we find is we don't actually have to rotate the factors that much. We can't reject the null that the rotation matrix is equal to the identity matrix. In other words, it looks like the, the, first, the first factor looks a lot like the, the way we would expect the indirect commodity factor to look. Uh, the second panel uh, shows that that conclusion is robust to different ways of estimating, uh, of applying uh, GMM. So this is what the indirect commodity factor uh, looks like. Uh, we've HP filtered it only for visualization purposes, and the gray shaded region uh, are the NBER recession dates. Now it's often dangerous to do an ocular uh, regression, um, but certainly uh, there's a strong cyclical component uh, uh, to the factor, uh, and it looks broadly correlated with, with uh, US, the US business cycle. So if we just focus uh, on the recent period, uh, so that this is, two th is the 2007-2008 recession, uh, what you see is that the factor uh, increased sharply and then decreased as, as, uh, with the onset of the global financial crisis, and then it rebounded uh, quickly after the, the global financial crisis. Um, so it, it, it looks like a measure of real activity. Uh, this conclusion is not sensitive to uh, using the sign restriction test. Um, this uh, figure reports the uh, rotated common factor uh, estimated using GMM and the minimum and the maximum values for the rotated common uh, factor subject to the sign restrictions. So those are the blue lines and it looks very similar um, uh, uh, to the way we estimated the factor using the first procedure. So given that, uh, we're going to interpret um, the first principle component as the indirect commodity factor. So that's the one related to global economic activity. And this permits us to do a decomposition of average price changes into changes of the two factors. So this is the change in the indirect commodity factor and the change in the direct uh, uh, commodity factor starting in 1968 and going up until 2013. And in the interest of time, let's just focus on, on the recent period. What this, decompo oops, excuse me, what this decomposition shows us is that the, the, de the average decline in commodity prices in, 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 in 2008 uh, was mostly related to uh, uh, the collapse in aggregate output related to the onset of the global financial crisis. So that's the, uh, that's, that's the blue region. But there are also commodity market-specific develop developments uh, that, that decrease the price as well. Um, and then the recovery uh, after in 2009 was mostly driven by the increase in, 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 in aggregate output. But if you go back in history, you can do a similar historical decomposition and look at different episodes to see to what extent each of the two factors were driving changes in commodity prices. Uh, if we interpret the uh, indirect commodity factor as the composition of these structural shocks, we can also uh, do a decomposition um, of the uh, change, uh, the percent change in, in an independently computed measure of global industrial production. So this is the UN series um, that we obtained from my colleague Christiana Baumeister. And you know what you can see. So so the, the fit is not perfect because there's model misspecification. Um, but what you can see, for example, here is that before the onset of the global financial crisis. Commodity market-specific developments, so shocks in commodity markets, which is the red region here, were actually redu reducing uh, the growth of global industrial production. And again, in, in the period where global output collapsed, most of the collapse um, in, in uh, global industrial production was uh, related to developments that were uh, orthogonal 
to commodity markets. That would be the, the, the blue region here, that would be the, the global financial crisis. It didn't have anything to do with uh, commodity market specific developments. There's a section in the paper about storage. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into it. Uh, one, one criticism of the model that we have is that there's no storage. And one of the first models people learn when they, when they start studying commodity markets is the storage model, you know, that, that, that uh, you can, you can uh, store commodities and that implies um, a set of relationships between the spot prices and the futures prices and inventories. Um, the point here is that we don't find much evidence that storage matters um, for uh, the commodities that, that we're considering. Uh, I'm happy to discuss this uh, after my talk is over, but I, I want to get to the forecasting part, so I'm going to leave that aside for the moment. So let me turn to the final uh, part of the paper, which is using the uh, indirect commodity factor in this forecasting exercise. Now, just to be clear, you could do this forecasting ex exercise without the model because you don't need, this, you don't need the economic interpretation uh, uh, to, to run a, um, uh, to compute forecast of, of real commodity prices. So what we do is, uh, in each case, we have a bivariate uh, factor uh, augmented vector autoregression of individual commodity prices, and also the commodity prices, uh, the prices of several widely used commodity price indices, such as the CRB, the World Bank, World Bank Index, and the IMF non-energy index. And we also look at the, at the uh, oil prices. So here we use the refiner's acquisition cost of imported crude oil. Um, and we compare the forecast in a recursive out-of-sample forecasting exercise, um, uh, the MSBEs of those forecasts to that of the no-change forecast. Uh, and we do it for the sample between 1984 and 2012. That's, based, that's related to data availability issues. Uh, I'm just going to focus on the results for the uh, commodity price indices uh, in the interest of time. The results are um, contained, the results for the individual commodity prices are, are, are in the paper, and I'm happy to discuss them. Um, so the most, the largest improvement in, uh, improvement in forecast accuracy is at the one month horizon for the World Bank Index. So this number here, 0.863, means that there was a, a 14 percent, using the model, there was a 14 percent improvement in forecast accuracy relative to the no change forecast at the one month horizon for that particular price index. There's about 11 percent improvement in forecast accuracy for the IMF index. And there's actually a quite surprising improvement in forecast accuracy for uh, the price of crude oil. Here you get a 21% improvement in forecast accuracy. Um, there are some smaller improvements in forecast accuracy at the three-month horizon, but then they disappear at longer horizons. Um, one thing to observe, and this is related to some work Lutz has done with, with my colleague, Christiana Baumeister. So these, this, the magnitude of this improvement in forecast accuracy for crude oil is similar to what Lutz uh, and Christiana find in work that, that uses a, 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 a VAR um, model of the, of the global crude oil market. Actually, these, this is a little bit uh, smaller improvement in forecast actually relative to their model, but it's of a comparable magnitude. And so, so you know, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us not only uh, is there the strong, you know, there are theoretical reasons to think that, that um, there's a pro-cyclical component to uh, the movements in commodity prices, but to some extent, um, you can use uh, measures, sort of, sort of this common cycle in commodity prices to get meaningful improvements in, 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 in forecast accuracy. And again, as I said, I'm just showing you this for the commodity price indices, for individual commodity prices. I mean, it's a little bit more mixed results, but in general, there are some improvements in forecast accuracy for individual commodity prices. Um, and so just to, just to conclude, uh, we sort of the three main conclusions here. One, you can use this simple structural macroeconomic model to assign uh, an interpretation to the statistical factors um, uh, that drive real commodity prices. Um, <clears throat> for the most part, the annual price changes have been related to global economic activity, which is consistent with economic intuition. Um, uh, and then finally, you can use the factor method to get, uh, uh, as a forecasting model, uh, to forecast uh, the prices of, of uh, uh, the real prices of uh, a variety of commodities, uh, including the price of crude oil. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat>
presentation. Our next speaker is Batin uh, Rizukin from uh, Bank of Canada too. And uh, we are going to discuss the financialization of food. Uh, yeah. Before I start my presentation, I would like to thank uh, Giuseppe, Matteo, and Nora uh, for inviting me here again. Uh, this is end time. I'm going to be here first. Okay. All right. Uh, let me uh, usual disclaimer. Uh, basically, uh, this opinions are all ours, not Bank of Canada or uh, U.S. Commodity Future Trading Commission uh, or any of the commissioners or any other uh, staff members. Uh, so, perfect. Uh, my presentation, first I'm going to uh, discuss some overview and related work and what's our question, what kind of data we are using and uh, I'll discuss a little bit about empirical approach and our result and uh, I'll conclude all that. Basically, uh, the question uh, or some observation First, uh, let's start with large investment money flows in commodity futures market, either through uh, commodity index investments or uh, by the hedge funds. And if you look at, for example, Barclay, uh, Barclay uh, commodity asset under management uh, in the third quarter of 2012, it reached about $439 billion before it uh, fell uh, $350 billion. Uh, in uh, March of 2014. But the fall is related to precious metal. It's nothing to do with agricultural commodities or energy commodities. Still, index uh, funds invest a lot of money in energy markets, uh, agricultural markets, but they withdrew their money from the precious metal. The question, of course, uh, what could this development means to price level, volatility, or uh, market images or correlation. First, uh, I did a lot of work on uh, impact of speculation on prices and volatility. In my own work, we did not see uh, much influence of speculation on prices. And we saw some, uh, what you call, effect on volatility, but uh, volatility, uh, by Hedge fund, uh, basically, uh, position of hedge fund generally reduces volatility rather than increasing volatility. Uh, yesterday there was some discussion here uh, about volatility between 2003 and onwards. Uh, in, our, in our estimation, we did not see, for example, uh, volatility is increasing between 2003 and 2008. It is actually very stable up until Lehman uh, collapse, basically volatility shoot up at, at that point because there are lots of uncertainty in the market. We have to realize one thing, like stock markets, uh, in the commodity market also, volatility generally tends to fall during good economic times or when prices rise. Volatility increases generally when prices are falling because it basically means that economic agents are unsure what kind of development coming. There are uncertainty uh, increased, like uh, after immediately after, after Lehman crisis. So volatility generally goes up during that period. And uh, today, focus particularly on market linkages about correlation. Uh, why we are looking at common moves? Uh, basically, uh, if you look at uh, so futures market, generally traditional commercial traders or floor broker traders do not trade <coughs> cross markets. For example, uh, floor broker traders, they have position during the day and by the end of the day, they just close, generally. <coughs> and then if they don't, they just go to option market to have uh, some kind of insurance. And of course, on the other hand, financial traders, like hedge funds, do trade cross markets. Uh, including the CIP traders, basically, uh, commodity index investment, basically, they are investing a uh, bunch of uh, what's called, uh, commodities. And if, uh, if you are investing in uh, Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, you are investing more than 24 commodities. Uh, so they do trade uh, cross market. 
In a financial uh, commodity market, returns may come move more because uh, this premium should be less affected by commodity specific uh, trader, uh, either uh, sympathetic shock, and also common factors may become relatively more important. If you are talking about the risk one, risk off factor, and then, uh, of course, uh, there are, it, all, most of the assets become riskier, so uh, the correlation between these assets has increased after human uh, collapse. Uh, what are the theoretical links between financialization and correlation? Of course, uh, commodity risk matters less to diversified financial players, uh, partly, uh, basically, and also financial traders differ from traditional traders and share two special features. One, incentive. Uh, Basha and Paolo uh, showed that uh, basically traders follow each other, kind of a herding behavior. And because they don't want to uh, perform less than their uh, peers, so they do generally invest in the same kind of uh, equity or commodity mix. And of course, the, the limits uh, to arbitrage literature uh, basically uh, how the traders behave under stress, basically. Uh, I believe uh, Lee Jean uh, and Tom Paper showed that uh, all these traders uh, withdraw their money during uh, of very uncertain periods and they transmit the shock to other markets. What's our question in this paper? <coughs> Basically, the question, does financialization drive equity, commodity, or cross-commodity correlation? Or basically, the question is, are financial traders simply a transmission channel uh, for fundamentals? And then we look at also whether the things, I mean, uh, the response function is different uh, before 2007 uh, or uh, after 2007 period. We use structural VAR, actually we use uh, some exogenous variable, I, could, I should call it uh, SYX, and uh, we check also uh, whether this response function different between pre- and post-crisis uh, period, and of course we control for commodity demand and supply. Uh, we proxy for financialization uh, using, uh, yesterday, uh, Leo was talking about, he used uh, some kind of modified version, but he used a uh, very simple uh, working key index, uh, basically intensity of speculative activity. Uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Basson defined uh, financialization in a more uh, subtle way, but our uh, definition of financialization the arrival of new traders, basically. Some, uh, what's called, dated back this financialization process, 2002, uh, with the, what's called, arrival of hedge fund and all this stuff, swap that uh, some others said no, it is also electronic trading and everything, but in our view, it is both combination, both uh, ETF stuff and all electronic trading, and also arrival of hedge fund and uh, what's called, uh, commodity index uh, trader, uh, what's called help to increase the financialization process. Uh, our markets, we basically uh, are interested in agricultural market grains and livestock. Uh, looks, uh, it's not happy uh, our using of food market uh, because it thinks that uh, food and agricultural market completely different, but still they are going to use okay, the food market. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I'll get this criticism later on. Uh, basically, uh, why we are uh, doing this one, basically, we can properly control for fundamental uh, factors in agriculture because we have inventory data and all this stuff, and we have a lot of information. Second factor is basically food prices tripled in 2007-2008 period, and then, of course, uh, there's this debate, it is uh, increasing food prices, hurting a lot of poor uh, people. Uh, so, let me go immediately to uh, related work, basically uh, financialization of commodity markets. If we uh, look at, for example, uh, how the arrival of these new types of traders increase the cross market correlation, I have a paper with Michel Goff <coughs> uh, published this year, or uh, 2014. Uh, we looked at over the weather uh, swap dealers or hedge funds uh, had uh, had increased in uh, cross-market correlation, uh, we conclude that it's not swap dealer because they are generally, sorry, commodity index dealers, 
uh, because they are generally what's called passive investors. They just put some money, uh, let's say 5% of their pension fund or something, uh, then, then they just leave the money over there. As opposed to hedge fund, they just uh, frequently move their money uh, across markets. So uh, we find that uh, hedge fund position might explain link between uh, I mean, cross-market linkages uh, as opposed to uh, commodity index trader. On the other hand, uh, for example, uh, the Young uh, and Pound paper suggests that actually commodity index investments might uh, help explain the linkages between. Uh, I have quite difficult time in understanding that proposition because uh, they do not move their money uh, frequently. Once they put the money, it's there. Uh, they just roll over uh, when the mature, uh, uh, what's called index uh, measures. Anyway, uh, in the present paper, basically, we control for demand and supply fundamentals. We show that speculation does not drive actual correlation and also explain the reduced predictive power in post price period. Uh, basically, there are lots of uh, books, and his co author uh, did a lot of uh, analysis of speculative role in commodity market using VAR, and then they uh, basically show that physical speculation to <coughs> actually inventories. Uh, and uh, in his paper, uh, they suggested they find that it is the fundamentals, not the speculation, uh, can explain 2007 2008 price hike on the other hand, uh, and the paper just came out in uh, the IMF, uh, basically, they again said that there's not much impact uh, on prices during 2007-2008 period, but later on 2010, I believe, they find a uh, small uh, but significant effect of speculation in prices. And, uh, of course, uh, in the financial speculation, uh, there are other papers with no common inventories, uh, corn volatility, uh, that's the uh, new paper. And in our paper, basically, uh, we use both real and financial speculation and actual inventories, new data set on egg fundamentals and uh, spec major adapted to analyze uh, for hedge fund role in, and also uh, commodity index trader role in uh, correlation. Again, uh, the question is here, does who trades drive the intensity of market linkages? And of course, theory side that yes, it could matter. Uh, basically, uh, traders incentive at financial institution who co cross market correlation, that's the Bashak and Palova paper. And during financial stress period, uh, basically, uh, once they move out their money, uh, then uh, the impact can be felt in both uh, market growth. Uh, equity and uh, commodity market, that's the uh, we drawn paper. Uh, for this one, who is the most uh, call, important candidate for uh, enhancing equity and commodity trading? We don't think traditional commercial traders, basically, they do not trade generally uh, across commodities. But hedge funds, they do. Uh, and then they enter and exit markets frequently and then trade across markets uh, to exploit mis uh, perceived mispricing. And of course, in our Paper, for example, uh, herding behavior. We analyzed 32 markets. Uh, on average, one hedge fund generally enters in five or more uh, markets, either commodity or uh, financial products. Here, uh, as I said, I define uh, we define the uh, financialization arrival of low frequency trading. Uh, by CITs, uh, Commodity Index Trader, or growth of high frequency trading, which is HFT, uh, uh, and then, of course, the increase in activity by hedge funds that trade across assets uh, classes. Uh, that is, uh, uh, for that one, it provides a lot of evidence uh, in our paper. Uh, I mean, my paper with the uh, Okay, here are interest, as I said, cross market linkages, equity, commodity, hedge funds. Commodity, commodity, hedge funds, plus the uh, commodity index traders. Basically, uh, what commodities we cover here, uh, is we like to have position data for all major agricultural uh, markets in the uh, world, but unfortunately, some contracts are non US, uh, like the Black Sea wheat or something, we don't have position data. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have good position data, uh, let's go. Uh, 
CFTC uh, collects uh, it is uh, daily uh, position data from each trader, uh, but we don't have those uh, virtual data in other uh, countries, except uh, ICO start to publish uh, CFTC community of trader type data for uh, brand crude oil and gas, uh, then uh, they are hoping, I believe, now uh, London Metal Exchange will provide some kind of uh, commitment of trader report for the industrial uh, metals. Bottom line, we, uh, we have four U.S. grain market, uh, grain futures, and then three U.S. livestock uh, market, which are corn, soybean, Kansas wheat, and uh, Chicago wheat. And then for the livestock, we have the live cattle, and pig cattle, and lean hogs. And uh, of course, we just uh, waited this uh, stuff to create some grain and uh, livestock uh, index uh, based on the electrical weights uh, provided us by the electrical GSCI. Okay, here, uh, position data. Unfortunately, CFCC put some uh, restriction to use in-house uh, position data. This is uh, segregated. We use here publicly available. Uh, data basically commitment of traders here. Uh, we have the commercial versus the non-commercial uh, traders, and then uh, of course there is some limitation. Uh, we are hoping to have access to that data that later in our project uh, to have to distinguish between the virtual swap dealers and then commodity index trader and all this stuff. All right. Uh, if you look at uh, what's happening in uh, speculation, basically speculation measured by uh, working key indexes up in across all markets. Uh, in the livestock, uh, for example, uh, it was average 25% in 2000, 2001. Now, uh, in, by 2007, it was 55%. Basically, 55%. As I said, uh, I mean, 55%. Let's call. Uh, Speculative positions do not need it in the market to satisfy the hedging demands. It was an excess speculation. And of course, uh, we saw substantial fluctuation in intensity, especially after Lehman demise, and a sharp increase in commodity specula uh, speculation after mid 2012. Uh, this is our uh, working key index uh, from 2000 to 2000. 13, as you see, there are some increase, uh, which will after Lehman collapse, but uh, later on decline, and then uh, in mid-2012, again, uh, we saw some increase. Uh, of course, uh, to measure the correlation between uh, cross-market and also uh, uh, equity, uh, commodity market, we use dynamic condition correlation. It generally estimates our at zero, but uh, we see uh, a lot of fluctuation uh, over time. And then uh, immediately after Lehman crisis, then uh, all the correlation increased, but they, later uh, this correlation uh, fall. Okay. Here uh, in our work, basically, we control for agricultural uh, fundamentals. First, uh, demands, uh, general, I mean, uh, demand, basically, uh, we use uh, helium. Uh, work on the real economic activity index. Uh, basically, correlation increased during or in aftermath of uh, down downturns. Basically, uncertainty increases That's why we uh, believe that uh, correlation, like volatility, uh, increases. Consumption, uh, of course, versus the speculative and precautionary demand. We look at the physical uh, speculation and also we look at also uh, commodity specific shock. For the supply, uh, of course, it, it likely affects the market. Uh, by a shock disconnect from uh, others, and the financial markets just discount this stuff. Uh, a lot of people say that uh, it has nothing to do with speculation or something, that it's just a uh, discount risk of factor uh, can explain this uh, increase or decrease in correlation. And uh, let me go over one by one, uh, measuring the state of macroeconomy. Uh, as I said, uh, aggregate demand is a major factor to impact prices and uh, uh, also correlation. Uh, of course, the appropriate measurement level, what is that? Uh, if we are going to take US or the world's uh, economic activity, if we look at the uh, US, we might use basically ADS, Aroba, Devolt, uh, Scott Index, but the world economy is much uh, more important for this market, so we use uh, 
real economic activity index suggested by uh, Kenyan. And then for the speculative demand, we look at uh, two uh, different uh, measures. Uh, it's basically mentors. Uh, two more forward-looking measures of mentors. One is slope of features term structures, uh, VP, that is available for all market. And for the robustness check, we look at the uh, stock forecasts, uh, basically uh, old and new crop uh, forecasts. Uh, so for the livestock market, again, uh, we have the uh, first of all, uh, slope of the uh, tissue term structure. And for the robustness check, we look at backward looking major inventories uh, by USDA. It is a uh, monthly event for uh, cold storage level. Uh, of course, this is a uh, limitation. It basically, it's public uh, storage. It's not private uh, storage. We don't have that information. But uh, we will use, uh, firstly, slope of features, term structures uh, as a measure uh, proxy for the metrics. Of course, uh, we have also some commodity-specific uh, shocks in the grain market, for example, for the corn ethanol dummy after 2005. For the livestock, we have mad, uh, mad cow disease or the swine flu. Uh, we generally expect that uh, if there is a commodity specific shock, then the correlation should drop uh, between the uh, stock market and the commodity markets. Oh, I got to use five minutes. Okay, I'll try to. Okay, for the uh, supply, uh, basically, uh, we have the, uh, for the uh, grain markets, we have uh, DP USDA crop progress and condition data information, uh, so, and also some indigenous control. Okay, let me go quickly to our empirical methodology. Four variables, uh, structural VIR model with exogenous variable, uh, basically, our uh, condition based to market condition, uh, demand, food market, uh, condition supply, storage, and speculation, and of course, Markets uh, return uh, and conditional correlation. And of course, low uh, moving variables are ordered before passing one, but we check for robustness changing the order and then our result still holds. Uh, two sub sample periods 2000, 2007, and 2007, 2013. And then uh, we boost up to the standard error period in terms of 90% uh, confidence interval. Okay, first, uh, Look at the, let's say, grain and equity. As I said, ship, uh, Kenyan measure, grain story, and grain uh, key index, and then DCC. And of course, we have exogenous variable supply, US weather condition, and ethanol shock. And then uh, for the livestock, again, uh, ship, uh, cold storage, and uh, slope of the uh, future service structure, and livestock, uh, key, and then DCC. Here, uh, exogenous variable again. U.S. weather condition and the damage to control swine flu and uh, mad cow disruption. Uh, this is the trend theme on basically grain equity in the pre-crisis period. Speculative intensity does not in itself affect the extent to which grain market move in sync with the stock market. Rather, financial speculators' future position facilitate the transmission of the initial market shock into grain markets. They basically, uh, let's call, react to the what is called uh, fundamentals. In the post-crisis period, macroeconomic co condition affected dynamic conditional uh, correlation transmission channel disappears uh, due to difficulty uh, of financing arbitrage and speculative position. For the livestock, again, no statistical evidence before or after uh, the crisis uh, that speculative intensity impact livestock equity correlation. Only macroeconomic conditions seem to matter. Basically, for grain as well as the livestock market, the position of spectators, uh, financial institutions, in commodity markets uh, do not seem to be the main explanatory factor uh, for uh, cross-market linkages. Uh, our takeaway on this one is the correlation fluctuates a lot, but no obvious trend in increasing correlation up until the dealing prices. Uh, crisis also ends 2012, and then we see correlation decline. And then speculation uh, cross market, cross section of the uh, commodity market increase. We observe that there is an increase in excess speculation, not excessive speculation, but excess speculation, uh, which is 
more than let's call uh, demand for hedging. Of course, uh, strength power of spec position in let's call correlation, you don't observe much stuff on that. But it is important to have uh, disaggregated reports on uh, let's call position of different traders to identify what impact might, for example, commodity index investment or commercial hedges might have. So, uh, unfortunately, we have, uh, we did use public available data that is only, I suppose, like commercial versus the non-commercial. Uh, we have disaggregated report, but it starts 2006, it doesn't serve our purpose uh, for before. And so, uh, that's my uh, end of my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you for speaking up again. So now uh, we, we are going to see the uh, advice of Professor Pien on the same topic. So, and also the cultural market. Thank you. Not quite the same topic. So, <laughs> this is uh, work, joint work with Christiane Baumeister. And again, the Bank of Canada is not to blame for anything that's in this presentation. So, the reason people care about food prices is twofold. One argument is short. In short, millions of people in poor countries are starving. And so that's kind of the line taken by the G20, saying increased food price volatility is causing lots of problems around the world. There's another argument, closer to home, that says it's a problem for especially poor people in the US because when food prices go up, essentially it's hard to put things on the table. And so there has been an increased interest in the pass-through from uh, higher agricultural commodity prices to retail food prices in the US. Now, in the middle of this discussion, it dawned on people that uh, food price increases actually might be an unintended consequence of value fuel policies. So the argument was that there were sustained increases in oil prices, there were sustained increases in food prices, or really agricultural commodity prices. And that suggested that uh, there was a link, or at least that link had been strengthened by biofuel policies, biofuels being produced from food commodities such as corn, grains, oil seeds, and sugar. And uh, the logical conclusion seemed to be that, well, perhaps we need to reduce or terminate biofuel uh, programs in order to stop food prices from going up. And indeed, there's an academic picture on this question, which has arrived at conclusions ranging from 10% to 100% of the increase in agricultural commodity prices being associated with biofuel policies. Um, the background here is that when you buy gasoline at the gas station, this is high-octane gasoline that is being uh, produced by mixing low-octane gasoline, essentially refined crude oil, with some additive. Uh, traditionally, there were two additives. Uh, ethanol being one option, uh, NTDE being another, that's a chemical compound that is highly toxic. Uh, when people figure this out, uh, Congress decided not to grant liability waivers to people using NTDE, so they stopped using it. And that change effectively meant that starting in May 2006, ethanol was the only additive you can use for producing high octane gasoline. Now since then, Congress essentially uh, in instructed industry to use ever more uh, uh, ethanol in producing gasoline production. The only constraint on what Congress can do has been engine technology, because if you mix too much ethanol into gasoline, your engine seize up. That creates problems, so there's a limit of 10% so far. That's as far as you can go. Now, in this paper, we're not interested in the effect of biofuel policies. That's a separate lecture on that. What we are interested in is something that has been asserted a lot, namely that there is a link between oil prices and food prices uh, that arose or these was strengthened in the context of um, biofuel policy. So after 2006, somehow there is a link between oil prices and food prices. Now, studying this is challenging for a number of reasons. First, you've got to be careful about distinguishing between agricultural commodity prices on the one hand and retail food prices on the other. Second, there's an energy lady problem. Um, so talking about causality here is tricky. Um, third, um, there is uh, potentially a reaction of the central bank to higher commodity prices. And we have to control for that in assessing what the effects of higher commodity prices are. And finally, if you're trying to study this, you need good data. And it turns out the only country with good data on this is the US. So that's what we're going to focus on.
So let's start by putting food price increases in historical perspective. You want to see how much uh, of a food price increase we had compared to uh, fuel prices or oil prices. Um, in particular, the concern is whether this relationship has tightened after May 2006, whether the volatility in the real price of food has gone up, and whether the correlation in the growth rates of uh, real oil prices and real food prices has gone up. All these three things have been asserted by the G20, for example. So let's start with volatility. Now, what I'm plotting here are growth rates. Growth rates before and after the middle of 2006 for, on top, the real price of oil, then the real price of corn, and then the real retail price of food. So let's start with oil. Going left to right, you see that really there hasn't been an increase in volatility except for one episode on the right when you see the oil price uh, drop, right? The growth rate uh, goes down. Well, that's the financial crisis, right? If you leave out the financial crisis, there is no sign that there has been a change in volatility, something that was discussed uh, earlier. When you look at the real price of corn again, you would be hard-pressed to argue that there's a big change in the volatility of these growth rates. And finally, when you look at the real price of food, again, there's only one big blip on the right, uh, this one here. Uh, that's again during the financial crisis. Uh, interestingly, you see that the growth rate goes up uh, at the time that the oil price goes down, which doesn't sit very well with this notion higher oil prices mean higher food prices, right? So right away you see there's a problem. So you can make this much more formal, and we do so in the paper. The first answer is there has been no increase in volatility, nor there has, been, has there been an increase in the correlation across growth rates. Didn't happen either. Now, what about the increases in prices per se? Well, if you look on the average rate of increase in the real price of food you pay in the supermarket, it has been under 1% per year. That's not a lot. If you look at real crop prices, so we talk in soybeans, wheat, rice, uh, etc., uh, somewhere between 7 and 15% per year. So that's a lot higher. And you might say, well, how can that be? And the answer is, well, if, let's say, you go to the supermarket and you buy bread, that bread is presumably made from wheat, but the cost share of wheat in the bread that you buy is only about 5%. We know that because that data from the USDA. That means if you have a 100% increase in the price of wheat, all else equal by construction, the price of bread should go up by 5%. And so once you keep that in mind, then actually there's no contradiction between little movement in retail food prices and potentially a lot of movement in agricultural commodity prices. So the question then is, is there a causal link from oil prices to crop prices? Well, uh, one problem here is endogeneity I mentioned. Uh, one way to wrestle with that is to say, let's focus on a historical episode where we know that the price of oil moved for reasons that had nothing to do with agricultural commodity markets. And that's what happened after the invasion of Kuwait, where you saw a huge spike in the real price of oil, and clearly that was exogenous. So if there is a causal link, you would expect that after that, food commodity prices should have gone up, crop prices should have gone up. And as the graph shows, nothing happened. Right? So we can be pretty sure there is no causal link before 2006, but maybe something changed and there was a causal link later. Why would something have changed? Well, lots of people have suggested that there was a structural break in about 2006, once we had biofuel policies, that these biofuel policies create a link that wasn't there before. So we're going to have to look at that. We're going to look at that now with the help of bivariate regressions, autoregressions, where we treat innovations to the real price of oil as essentially contemporaneously exogenous, and we see what happens to the real price of food. Now, um, we're going to focus on the real price of food uh, for several reasons, one of which is that this nets out the effect of any monetary policy reaction on the price level, right? Because that affects food prices as well as all other prices. If you look at the relative price of food, well, then you see what is the extra movement in food prices that we're concerned with. So here we split the sample before and after the middle of 2006. In the first part, if you have a 1% oil price shock, what happens to food prices? Well, if anything, they go down. They certainly don't go up. But after the middle of 2006, you get a nice, significant, positive response of the real price of food. There's only one catch. You have to read the scale. Because what you see is that this 1% real oil price shock gives you an increase in food prices of 0.05%. It's significant, but it's not big. Now, why would you get a significant response? Well, there are two channels. One channel is maybe food prices go up 
because crop prices go up in response to an oil price shock. The other story is that it's really what happens between the wheat being harvested and the bread showing up in your supermarket that is driving this response. That is, what people refer to loosely as the cost of food marketing, processing, refining, etc., uh, transportation, that part is sensitive to the price of oil. So we're going to look at both, starting with the first one. Now, let's think first theoretically about what's going on here. And let's start with the premise that when gasoline producers blend low-octane gasoline with ethanol, that they do so in approximately fixed proportions, like Leontia, if you like. Right? Now, if you have an oil price shock, because there is a supply disruption in the oil market, what is that going to do to the price of ethanol and, in general, the price of food? Well, it's actually going to drive it down, because you're going to slow down the economy, the demand for gasoline is going to down, go down, and that means, ultimately, the real price of food is going to go down, which is the opposite direction of what people are asserting. To get a positive core movement, you need increased oil demand, for example, associated with the global business cycle, in that case, you're going to drive up the price of oil, and in general, the demand for gasoline, and that, in turn, is going to lead to higher demand, potentially, for food. But, of course, it's not really the oil price that's causing this. The oil price is the victim here, right? The oil price is moving in response to the same demand push as all other prices. And so we've got to be careful about causality in that context. Now, what if you relax that assumption of fixed proportions? Well, then, if the price of oil goes up, you're going to substitute more ethanol, you're going to mix more ethanol into your gasoline uh, because that's relatively cheaper. But of course, we know that that happened only during very brief periods because, in general, engine technology uh, will put a limit on what you can do. So that cannot be a big deal overall. Now, there's a third argument here, and that's a cost-push argument, which is to say if you're growing crops on a farm, you have to use a tractor and other equipment that requires diesel fuel. So if the price of oil goes up, well, you're going to have to spend more on that, and that's going to drive up the price of crops. The problem is that the share of fuels in agricultural production is quite small. And so you can do a back-of-the-envelope calculation to show that that can't be what's driving things. So we're going to have a hard time theoretically explaining how anything but a shift in demand could move these crop prices. And indeed, that's consistent with empirical work. So here we're looking at various uh, crop prices, corn, wheat, soybeans, and rice. Before 2006, on the left, Basically, not much is happening. Uh, there's n it's not big. It's not significant. It looks a little bit better on the right. Not super impressive, but maybe there is a little bit uh, of evidence of crop prices going up. The question is, why is that happening? Is that a cost-push story, or is that a demand-pull story? Well, we can look at another natural experiment. Um, fortunately for us, um, when you look at the price of fertilizer, very important, of course, for agricultural production, nitrogen fertili fertilizer is actually produced from natural gas, not using crude oil. And because of shale gas in the United States, the wellhead price of natural gas has been dropping a lot, while the price of oil has been going up. That means we know for a fact that there cannot have been positive cost push in the fertilizer market, because fertilizer production doesn't depend on uh, oil, and if you find that there is a positive response in the fertilizer price, that tells us it must be coming from demand, right? Because by construction, there is no cost push. So this is what the data show us. You see positive significant responses in fertilizer prices, fuel prices for farms, and animal feed. That's all about a demand story. So that's an important insight. Now, uh, the second, I'm going to come back to that later, the second story for why the retail price of food might go up is about the cost of food marketing being influenced by oil price shocks. What's food marketing? Well, it's processing, storage, packaging, advertising, transportation, local distribution. Uh, that's most of what you pay for in the supermarket. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a number of different um, agricultural products, I mean, dairy products, meat, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to look at this at different stages of production. We're going to see whether the price at one stage relative to the previous stage is sensitive, if that spread is sensitive to an oil price shock. And now there's lots of stuff in the paper. Here's just one example for pork and beef. Now, this is set up so we're looking at the difference between the wholesale and the retail price and the farm price and the wholesale price. We're looking at responses to oil price shocks. If the usual story is right, those responses should be significant and positive. They're not. And that's a generic feature for every one of about 10 examples we looked at. So there is no evidence whatsoever that oil price shocks are driving these food marketing costs. So 
let's summarize this quickly. What we've seen is that if you have a 1% real oil price shock, the peak response in crop prices is 0.5%. The peak response in retail food prices is 0.05%. Uh, whatever you're seeing has nothing to do with the cost of food marketing or cost push. It's driven by the demand side. The demand side could be many things. It could be biofuel subsidies and policies, substitution effects, business cycle effects, etc. So let's look at this more closely. Let's look in particular at the role of the global business cycle. Um, now, we're going to do that uh, using a result from the related literature on oil markets where, we have, where people have worried about identifying the role of flow demand. We're going to take flow demand shocks from that literature and run a simple distributed lag model relating the change in the real price of corn, for example, to current and lagged values of these flow demand shocks to see how much variation in global industrial activity through its ultimate effect on real incomes drives the real price of corn. And the coefficients of that regression are just, well, the impulse responses. And what you find is that apparently these flow demand shocks systematically drive up the real price of agricultural commodities. The results are imprecisely estimated, not surprisingly, but in general, they look positive. And what you can do then is to say, well, if I take this, what about the cumulative effect of these uh, flow demand shocks associated with the business cycle? And the answer is they explain somewhere between 15 and 30% of the variation in agricultural crop prices, which is interesting because there's some people out there who claim that effect should be zero. Now, the next thing we do is we take out that business cycle effect, and we look at the residuals in the growth rate of the crop prices. And so one thing that's interesting is if you think of financialization in these markets being important in driving uh, crop prices, you would expect that sometime to the left over here, all of those prices should have gone up at the same time. And obviously they don't. In fact, uh, if you look across different rows, there is a surprisingly, uh, surprisingly low degree of co-movement. And so one thing you can do is you can look at these correlations. Uh, when you look at wheat, soybeans, and corn, you find their correlations around 0.5, roughly. And that's not entirely unexpected because there's some substitution. Soybeans are also used as a biofuel. Uh, so there are reasons why there would be this correlation. But look at rice. If you look at the growth rate in the real price of rice, there's essentially no co-movement. And that's not surprising because when you think of the production of rice, that's done on wetlands. Those wetlands cannot be used to grow wheat or soybeans or corn. And so there's actually uh, limited substitutability in production. And yet we see the price of rice go up a lot as well. So clearly that's not a biofuel story, right? There must be another reason why the price of rice is going up, even controlling for the business cycle. In fact, you can look at these correlations before and after 2006. If biofuel policies were the answer, those correlations should systematically go up, but actually they don't, right? And so even the biofuel story doesn't seem to do a great job at explaining these movements. This is another uh, nice example for the real price of rice. Why rice? Well, lots of people in poor countries eat rice, so it's important. Now, what Jacob said, shared a very good example in his chart here. You see how at the beginning of the example, there appears to be strong positive co-movement between the real price of oil and the real price of rice. And people said, yeah, of course, it's related. But then, Starting in 2008 till the end of the sample, that co-movement is negative. Just the opposite of what people are asserting. And so that's another example why the story is much more complicated. Now, let's take this back to uh, the implications for, in particular, poor people in the United States. What we showed is that there is no food crisis. In fact, there is no increase in food price volatility. There is no increase in food prices beyond the 1%, which is not very high. And so if you're worried about welfare in the US, there's no reason to worry. This is a non-issue. What about other industrialized economies? Well, the problem is they don't have data. Um, but we know that the story must be the same, ex ante, because they also eat processed food a lot, and they don't spend a lot of their income on food, so they're very similar to the US. And indeed, one way of checking that is to look at the real growth rates in retail food prices. And it turns out in all those countries, that growth rate is very low, just like in the US. Right? So no problem there either. It changes when you look at developing economies, because there people don't eat as much processed food, so you're much closer to the original market for the agricultural raw materials, and you spend a lot more of your income, if you're poor, on food. And so you're much more sensitive to these price fluctuations. So what about all these studies at the World Bank and elsewhere worrying about this? Well, the problem, it turns out, uh, to be that there are no retail food price data for staple foods in developing countries. 
make use those countries usually don't have very good CPI data. Now, what have people done then? Well, they have done one of two things. One is to conduct surveys in selected countries in selected locations and work with those, but they are very local, right? They're not covering the developing world or even a particular country, and they're for very short time spans. And so if you're trying to understand the dynamics of these markets, it's very hard to study that with survey data. The other thing people have done is they have simply assumed or postulated that the global food commodity price data, agricultural commodity price data, is the same as the local price of the staple food. That's not a great assumption for a number of reasons, one of which is that in many of these countries the exchange rate moves a lot in one or the other direction. And so if you just look at the exchange rate, well, then the actual price of the local staple food might be quite different than the global commodity price. And so we can't just ignore that. Now, the next question is, well, even if you took for granted that there are these fluctuations, is that good or bad for welfare in those countries? That is not obvious, as it turns out. It depends a lot on the trade and agricultural policies. For example, there was a World Bank study that showed that Vietnam, the poor people in Vietnam, actually benefited from rising agricultural commodity prices. Now, why is that? Well, you have a fairly egalitarian land distribution. Lots of people are working in agriculture, and if there's a boom in the price of rice, you get to producing, and you earn more income. It's actually a good thing for the welfare of the poor people in that country. A counterexample would be Pakistan, where people don't care about agricultural production. You care about subsidizing the urban poor, and that requires spending money on food, and if imported food becomes more expensive, you're in trouble. But then we're getting to the point where we don't want to confuse domestic policies toward the agricultural sector over the last 20 years with whatever is happening in global commodity markets, right? So if you're talking about causality, it's not clear what the causal link is. Now, there is another complication here, and that is that in response to rising food commodity prices, lots of developing countries started using protectionist measures. They essentially said, we're not going to export any more food, we're going to keep ours, just in case. But of course, that amplified the scarcity of food in global commodity markets. And so you might argue that those countries uh, by themselves created part of the problem. So we cannot think of rising global commodity prices for food as being exogenous with respect to those countries. And so really, uh, it is, we don't know a lot about these things, although it's asserted a lot, and the, the analysis is much more complicated. So to conclude, uh, biofuel policies are only one of many explanations of global crop price increases. Uh, there is certainly no compelling evidence for independent causal effects of oil price shocks. And as far as welfare implications more generally is concerned, it's also clear that we need a much more nuanced analysis than the punchline of the G20 or the UN or the, the World Food Policy Institute and other institutions. Um, this is really much more subtle. Now time for the debate. Is the part which is related to storage. Um, so the, I mean, so so one obvious. Uh, uh, criticism of the way we've set up the models is, is that, th that there's no storage in it. Um, so we, we have three arguments in the paper about why uh, we don't think, or, or there's no evidence that, that, that storage would materially change the, the conclusions. Uh, the, let me step back for a moment and say that, that storage w would matter because the aggregation result that we have where we can uh, represent the structural shocks as uh, a single factor, as the composition, uh, would break down if uh, the response of different commodity prices had radically, uh, were radically different uh, in, in response to the structural shocks. And that would happen if there were storage, okay? So, uh, in fact, this is important for, for our argument. The first piece of evidence that we uh, use, uh, or, th or the, fir the first argument that, that we make in the paper, is that you know if if that argument were true, you would expect there to be a, a lot of um, uh, that there would be a, uh, that you would need more than simply two factors to explain the covariation in the data. Okay, so in the limit, we have forty commodities. You might need forty different factors, right? So that you know that would be where, where each of the there were n there were no uh, 
innovations in the in the real commodity prices were completely independent of each one were independent from each other. So that's clearly not the case. Uh, the second piece of evidence is is we actually collected. Uh, consumption and production data and computed what we call net purchases. So this you can interpret as inventory accumulation. One problem with dealing with a broad cross-section of commodities is, is you don't always have reliable inventory data like you do in, in, in the oil market. But we did some work and for 32 of the 40 commodities we got a proxy, so this net purchases data, so this is the gap between production and consumption. Um, uh, and what we did is, is, is we derived uh, uh, an implication from the model, which was that, what, well, if, if storage really, really does matter, then in the steady state of the model, net purchases should be non-zero. And in most cases, we're, able, we we're unable to reject the null that net purchases were, were zero. And this is using data, annual data going back to the uh, 19, late 1960s, so from 1968 until 2013. And then the third piece of evidence, uh, which has an interesting uh, relationship to U.S. monetary policy um, is that if storage mattered, you would think at the margin uh, unexpected changes in U.S. interest rates would matter because in terms of the storage decision, re U.S. real interest rates uh, enter the cost of carry. And so we, we uh, uh, some work that Ollie has done on U.S. monetary policy, he has a, he has a U.S. interest rate shock series that we use in a, in a VAR. And what we, so if storage mattered, we would expect storage to matter across commodity markets, so there should be a statistically significant response to the direct commodity factor. In other words, U.S. monetary policy should affect uh, uh, the common factor in commodity prices that's, that, that's related to commodity market-specific developments. And in fact, we find the opposite. We find that uh, if there's any effect of, the, of U these U.S. monetary policy shocks, it's on the indirect commodity factor. And so this would suggest that, that, that th th there is an effect of U.S. monetary policy on the co-movement in commodity prices, but it, it seems to be operating through sort of a spillover effect of a stimulative U.S. monetary policy spilling over to global economic activity, which then uh, increases the demand for commodities. So those are the three pieces of evidence we look at to uh, rule out the, the importance of storage. No, I have questions <laughs> for Ron. <laughs> well, why don't you hold your questions and then you can ask, you can ask them after you answer mine. <laughs> um, I'm going to start off by saying, before you gave your talk, I probably would have been inclined to believe the received wisdom. So I thought your presentation was, was quite compelling. But I have, I have two. These are either quibbles or just points of suspicion. Number one has to do with the, the role of flexibility in blending ethanol. Mm -hmm. There's a blend wall, which puts in a hard constraint, or at least a constraint, as an upper bound, but that does not preclude blending in less. And my recollection is that in the heart of the sample period that you are thinking about, gasoline pumps would regularly say may contain, not does contain, but may contain up to 10% ethanol, which suggested to me that maybe there was some um, variation that one would observe. I wonder if you have any, any insights or evidence or anything that you can offer up on that. Uh, the second is a little bit more of a hard quibble, and that is my understanding is that petrochemical, uh, you, you made an assertion that natural gas is used for petrochemicals and not oil. I think that may be true now, but not so much in the past. I suspect, particularly if you go back, say, prior to 2008, when gas and oil prices were highly correlated, um, my instincts are that a lot of that correlation is coming from from the, the feasibility of substituting between those two fuels. In particular, naphtha, I think, is, is directly usable for petrochemicals, and it's an important byproduct of uh, refining gasoline. So uh, maybe there's a shift that's taken place in here. You can speak something to this. I doubt either of these things undermine what you're saying, but I'd be interested to hear how you think that those particular issues factor in. Yeah, let's start with the second one. So you're certainly right about petrochemicals. My concern for the natural experiment was not petrochemicals in general, but very specifically nitrogen fertilizer. Now, the uh, nitrogen fertilizer producers in the U.S. are all located in the southwest, directly next to the wellheads for natural gas, and that has been the case for decades. In fact, I don't think you can produce nitrogen fertilizer with anything else but natural gas. Uh, 
So it's a very clean natural experiment, which is not to undermine your point more generally about petrochemicals, but that doesn't affect my argument in this paper, which was specifically looking at the response of fertilizer prices to oil price shocks, showing that if that response is positive, given that the input price in producing fertilizer has gone down, it is a clear indication that it must be about a demand shock. So that is robust to this. Uh, on the variation in blending, my understanding is that gasoline producers tend to blend in proportions that at least in the short run are fixed. Now, is that questions of adjusting the process that it's too costly to do that? I don't know. I'm perfectly willing to grant you that one could tinker with this on the margin, but keep in mind that the entire range we're talking about was 4% at the beginning of this period, 10% at the end. So we're talking about a, a range of uh, six percentage points, right? That's not a whole lot to start really affecting the price. You just do the math in terms of what each component costs and what the effect on the uh, product price would be. And it, it's clear that that effect must be small. So I'm not saying that there is zero substitutability in reality. That was just a thought experiment to organize our thoughts. The argument was that if I have to choose between these two extremes, we're probably closer to the Leontief type setup than we are to the perfectly flexible setup. And that's telling you something about what magnitudes you should expect in response to an oil price shock. Well, remember that corn is being used for many things, only one of which is that, so you have to weight this by the, I guess the upper bound is 40% or so, it could be much smaller, right? If you attach all those weights to it, right, that it becomes much harder to explain big effects. I perfectly agree. You can construct cases where if there is a particular shortage, maybe not enough stocks available, where in the short run you could see a big movement. But if you're talking here about what's happening over the course of several years, you might see a spike, right? I can see that easily. It's much harder to explain how you get something systematic. The other thing that's interesting in that context is after you control for the global business cycle, right, you don't see any sustained increase in the real price of corn, right? So. Maybe you can explain various blips in, in the data on that basis. And in fact, uh, one of the papers I cited about the effect of biofuel policies pointed out that what might be going on is that you not only have higher flow demand for corn because of the increased use uh, of uh, corn production, but you might have an additional effect that people are stockpiling corn in anticipation of even higher increases in the demand for ethanol and therefore for corn in the future, right? And so you could get an amplifying effect. But the point is that once you take out the effect of the business cycle, it's not that persistent anymore. So it's certainly a contributing factor, but it's, uh, what, what I try to show is that it is not the case that everything after taking out the business cycle can be explained by biofuel policies. Sorry, you had some questions? Yes, for, for Ron. So first one is a suggestion. So you constructed your index of uh, the global business cycle. And you compared it uh, verbally to the US. I'm not sure that's what you want to do because it's supposed to be a global index, so it's not, there's no reason to focus on the US. And you compared it to world industrial production. A quite natural thing to do would be to compare it to the reactivity index uh, that uh, Bahadi mentioned, which is much closer in spirit to what you're trying to capture. And so an obvious question is, well, how correlated are those two? Do they look alike? Do they not look alike? Uh, so that was the suggestion. The question was, and I couldn't get this from your presentation, uh, when you do your outer sample forecasting exercise, do you re-estimate the factor model, and that includes redoing the standardization of the data, everything in a true recursive setting? Yes. Including the standardization of the data? Yes, yeah, okay. Everything is done at each step mm -hmm. of, the, of the estimation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
because one of the, at least in Europe, one of the problem is uh, uh, not necessarily the price level of the volatility, but also the, the, the point of uh, uh, reliance on the imports and uh, food security. Yeah, so I think the concern is that if you're Pakistan and you have to import rice in order to feed the urban poor, right, that you may not be able to do that. That argument is really an argument about rising prices, not an argument about volatility. Right? Volatility is not in the data and it's not what, what the concern is, but when you read the reports by the 20, they make it all about price volatility and non existing volatility. I so, <laughs> but the point is, yeah, of course, I mean, if you're a poor country, you may not be able to import as much as you would like because you can't afford it, right? Because you don't have the foreign exchange to do it. Now, th there is trade that we know about also between Europe and the United States. Uh, Europeans have uh, decided to introduce far-reaching goals for the use of ethanol and other biofuels, forgetting about the fact that you have to produce that stuff. And they're not able to produce it in part because they were uh, betting on the development of new technologies that still don't exist for producing alternative biofuels, second generation biofuels. And so what happened initially is that a lot of biofuels uh, for Europe were imported from the US. So you get an indirect effect there, right? Where the US essentially is producing the ethanol that is then being shipped to Europe to be used there. Now that stopped for, uh, I mean there were trade issues, protectionist issues, uh, and so they largely switched, in more recent Europe, largely switched to importing from South America instead of the US. But it's still true a lot of the biofuels used in, the, the, in Europe are coming from around. So you mentioned uh, the economics of ethanol production in the US changed drastically in the last couple of years because there was also subsidies <coughs> for the production of ethanol. So I thought that the argument of uh, the correlation between uh, the price of corn and oil really concentrated in, on that 06, 07 period uh, because in the last couple of years, uh, the production of ethanol has become uh, much less attractive with the expiration of that subsidy. Yes, there were various subsidy-like measures that expired, I think it was in 2011 or so. So we talked about 2006 to 2011, uh, that's most of the sample period that we're looking at in the, in the second part. So yes, I mean, you, you might think that that would change things to some extent, but there is no way of disentangling this uh, at an even finer uh, time scale. I mean, this is uh, sort of the bare minimum to run any regressions to get some average sense. So you want to interpret the results for the second part of the sample as an implicit average. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lutz, uh, Lutz for a very uh, convincing uh, presentation. I think uh, there's also the issue of the market structure that you might need to look at, uh, and I think it will actually reinforce your arguments. Uh, for instance, in, uh, in the UK, there's always a debate on the power of supermarkets, of trying to squeeze the farmers and trying to, uh, to uh, the producers. Um, uh, and that's why we don't see the feedback into the retail prices. That's how they're able to maintain. So I think if you include it actually as one of the explanations as well, I, I, I think it will reinforce uh, your arguments as well. So just, uh, just an observation. Right, I mean, that, that's a, I mean, the generic argument, in fact, uh, when we talk about cost push, right? The notion is that the producer has higher costs and then pushes all those costs to the final consumer. There's, of course, an implicit statement there that the final consumer will actually take it, right? That, that, that the final consumer will pay whatever it takes to get the food as opposed to shopping somewhere else. So, and so, I agree, yes. I have a, an observation to make on Bahatin's presentation. You referred to the working tea index that you have used and I have used as well. Uh, I found with, in regard to oil that there was a problem with the index the way he defined it in that he divides the long or short position depending on what, who you're looking at by the, both the long and short positions. Whereas I looked at the net position, so I took the ratio of so let's say short to the net position of the speculators and that amplifies the, the variation the speculation intensity, and I found that that explained quite a lot uh, in the crucial period of 2008 and 9, and then of course the index went right down again. So maybe if you used something, a modified version of it, you would get more of a speculation intensity in the periods when you think it should be working. Just yeah. an idea. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it might be, but the idea here basically is uh, we are trying to make. No, I know your uh, uh, intensity index might be 
uh, reading will take time to get the material. So yes, uh, you have to write that we are looking page, in, page long and short position because we are trying to measure the extent to which uh, speculation is more than uh, unpaged position. I right? understand that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it might be much an idea. Anyone last question? Yeah, um, two. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hatin, if you would, and, and, and maybe we'll have to go offline if we need, but I, I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, what you, your reference to excess speculation. And then for Ron, um, and I was just trying to think of how I wanted to word this, and, and maybe you'll even put this in the category of, of hypothetical um, paranoid reactions. But if somebody um, just heard your results and said, ah, so there it is, economic activity, uh, made, whatever, made people wealthier, and the reason we had this, these indirect effects on commodities was increased speculation. What I'm really wondering is, is there anything you looked at in that study uh, or related to it where you just dismiss that out of hand because you'd say, hey, no, 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 you can't say that because. Sort of like what you explained um, on the storage or is it something you say, no, nah, even though you don't think that's the case, you'd have to go back and, and look a little bit further. I know that's been addressed in many, many other studies. I'm just wondering if there was anything in particular in your study that said, eh, I can just reject that out of hand. I think mean, I was very clear, uh, we should not, uh, let's go, confuse excess speculation and excessive speculation because here, the idea here that uh, how much the speculation exceeds the unhedged, let's go, uh, demand, basically, it has nothing to do with the excessive speculation, we don't know what the definition is, basically, CFTC cannot define it, and I don't know what is excessive speculation or excessive volatility, here, excess uh, speculation is very, uh, clearly, how uh, basically I'm just looking for to which speculation exceeds the level required to offset any unbalanced edging demands. That's all. I mean, it's nothing to do with the excessive speculation. It might actually help if you call this, I don't know, financial investor activity index or something like that to even move away from the word speculation because otherwise people will jump on this and misinterpret it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the session. Oh, right. Right. We can take this conversation offline. The short answer is, is no. We didn't. I mean, in terms of the model, there's no, there are no financial markets. There's no speculation. But I have a longer answer that I can give you. Like, in the interest of time, we can discuss it over coffee. Okay. Thank you very much.